Welcome everyone to tonight's event. I'd like to thank our author and guest speaker, Madeline Henry, for being here with us tonight. I'm Tierney Miller. I'm head of reference and adult services at the Cherry Hill Public Library. I wanna start by telling you a little bit about tonight's author. Her name is Madeline Henry, and she is the author of two novels, The Love Proof and Breathe In, Cash Out. The Love Proof was selected by the New York Times as a new and noteworthy book, and her novels have been featured in the Washington Post, the New York Post, and Parade Magazine, as well as a starred review in Kirkus, which we in the library profession know is no small feat. Uh, Kirkus tells the truth, so if you get a starred review in there, you know it's good. Uh, previously, Madeline worked at Goldman Sachs after graduating from Yale in 2014. She shares more about her life on at Madeline Henry Yoga. And here's the book that we're going to be talking about tonight, The Love Proof. It's fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It's a wonderful love story with elements of science and a little bit of um, metaphysical, um, the kinds of things you don't usually read about in a romance story. Really smart characters, um, in-depth folks. And I really, anyone who hasn't read it yet, get on it. Um, so a little bit about the book before we dive in. Uh, this book is about a brilliant physicist studying the nature of time who embarks on a journey to prove that those we love are always connected to us, leading to surprising revelations in this fresh and unique love story. Sophie Jones is a physics prodigy on track to unlock the secrets of the universe, but when she meets Jake Christopher during their first week at Yale, they instantly feel a deep connection as if they've known each other before. Quickly, they become a couple and slowly their love lures Sophie away from school. When a shocking development forces Sophie into a new reality, she returns to physics to make sense of her world. She grapples with life's big questions, including how to cope with unexpected change and loss. Inspired by her connection with Jake, Sophie throws herself into her studies, determined to prove that true love belongs together in all realities. Spanning decades, The Love Proof is an unusual love story about lasting connection, time, and intuition. It explores the course that perfect love can take between imperfect people and urges us to listen to our hearts rather than our heads. So let's get started in our conversation, Madeline. Thank you for being here tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Tierney. I'm really excited. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. First question, uh, without giving too much away in the story. So my goal for tonight is to tell people just enough about the book that they will want to read it, but certainly not to spoil it for them. So let's see if we can do that. <laughs> um, Sophie makes a major discovery in the study of, of space and time during the course of the book. If you would talk a little bit about her discovery and the kinds of research that you conducted to bring this piece of the story to life. Absolutely. So that question, I think, taps into my intention for the book. And my intention for this book was to communicate a very specific emotion. And that emotion is feeling connected to people who are not physically in your life. And so people can stay in your heart. And that is really the feeling at the core of this book. And so I know that there are a lot of facts in this book. This book explores the cosmos and space and time, but really all of those facts and all of the science, they serve an emotional purpose and that's to heighten and accentuate and express feelings. And the feeling, uh, so my research process was very emotion-based. I would start with the question, what do I want people to feel? And then I would, through publicly available studies and information, find the science and facts to express that feeling, um, which is a little bit of a different way to go about the writing process. And I do appreciate that. Um, and so the realization that Sophie comes to in the book, which I will not give away because this is a spoiler free zone. Um, <laughs> it is a theory that is discussed at the highest level of physics today. And once understood it, if it is true, then it explains perhaps why we feel connected to people who are no longer in our lives. Um, my own personal background in math and physics is I was always naturally interested in the concepts of it. I was an avid reader of Ryan Green and Michio Kaku and Neil deGrasse Tyson as a kid. And then in college, I did at one point intend to be a physics major, took physics at Yale, 
ultimately decided that the computation of that was extremely boring um, and time consuming. So it was just a double whammy of things I didn't want to do. Um, and so I went into a more, I love discussing infinity, but I didn't want to actually do the problems about it. So I found my happy medium um, and now I write fiction about science. <laughs> so that was my research process. That's great. Um, so my next question kind of, you know, leads in from there. What led you to these characters and their love story? Were there other books, stories, movies, shows, or anyone in your real life that inspired you to create this story in these characters? Great question. So I would say that it's a pretty complex story. And so there are several sources of inspiration. And one of them is my own life. So just to give a brief a sketch of where this book falls into my own personal life, I graduated from Yale and then I went into finance and I was writing on the side. And I was writing what became my debut novel, Breathe In, Cash Out, which is about an investment banker who desperately wants to become a yogi. And it's very different from this book. That book is sassy and fast paced, edgy, biting. And uh, it's filled with anecdotes about life on Wall Street that explains what it's like for young people there today. And I've always wanted to be an author, wrote two books in college that went nowhere, kept writing. So this book was my, which was my debut, was my third full length novel. And as soon as I sold that, I left the field of finance. So there's almost uh, an infinitesimally small amount of time between the book deal and leaving the field. And so what I did is I took an enormous leap of faith, which looking back on it is even um, riskier than I ever could have imagined. But I was very, I had high conviction of how I want, what I wanted to do, which is that I wanted to write The Love Proof. So I left finance and I was writing this story that I wanted to be rich with all of the things that my life until that point had lacked. So what, like Sophie, who undergoes a very radical transition in this book, from quantitative physics prodigy to someone who values connection and um, authentic deep connection in her life, I went through a radical transition going from a very analytical field, which was very quantitative, focused on problem solving and was relatively isolated. I transitioned from that to this life where I wanted to value connection more. And I wrote that into this story. And so that was the main source of inspiration. And I was just hungry and thirsty for um, feeling connected to other people, uh, similar to what Sophie uh, feels in this book and what Jake, uh, he has his own kind of isolation in the book as well. And so the characters are really outgrowths of that desire to express the meaning of relationships um, in, in life. And I think that I come from a, a pretty high pressure background. I went to Yale, then I worked in finance at Goldman Sachs and uh, relationships were not emphasized in those arenas. And I really woke up to their importance um, in my twenties uh, because the, they had not been rewarded. Um, I had always been rewarded for achievement which is something that the physics prodigy in this story um, experiences. And so those uh, go into the central idea of this story which is that intellect is overvalued and life should be lived from the heart and the characters are meant to express that. So they are more, um, it's a very high concept story uh, and the characters exist to express and communicate these ideas. Yeah, it, it certainly reads that way. There's a lot, when you're finished reading it, there's really a lot to think about. <laughs> um, I found myself kind of pondering a lot of, a lot of questions about the nature of work and love yeah. and friendship and um, what it all means. Thanks. One character I will say that I really liked was Sophie's mom mm. um, because she, I don't think I'm giving too much away. It's sort of her, she appears most at the beginning of the book. Um, she, to me, kind of flew in the face of your stereotypical prodigy's parent. Mm. Um, you know, sometimes the stereotype of a parent of a child like that is the one driving them towards the ambition um, or the success. But it seemed like she kind of always had an eye on Sophie's heart and like her, what we would now call social emotional learning, which I think when 
when Sophie was a kid, they might not have called it that yet. Or <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know about that yet. If they did, she um, knew about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. She would have read a book on it. Um, but I, I really liked that because I felt like she was sort of guiding her on a path that maybe Sophie would eventually find herself. Thank you for saying that. I really enjoyed writing Sophie's mom, Isabel, who's a very interesting character because she is extremely gifted. She has a background in astrophysics. Um, she worked at NASA. She was a brilliant student and she makes the decision to de-emphasize achievement and to emphasize relationships in her own personal life. And so when she's raising her daughter, who has this incredible analytical ability and the ability to absorb information instantly and this insatiable intellectual curiosity, Isabel makes the decision not to nurture the intellect, but to nurture the heart and to nurture Sophie's ability to connect with other people because she knows that she will not get that encouragement from any of the institutions in her life. And they will seek to leech off of her brain and to use her intellect to advance mankind, um, but, not, but that will not fulfill her daughter. And so I think it's really fascinating to see very smart, accomplished people to talk about the importance of relationships and to talk about the heart in a way that is smart. And I think that um, I've done a lot of events for the Love Group. And uh, one of the more impactful ones for me personally was at an engineering school where I heard from students who were talking about how um, relationships were not encouraged because they were looked down on in the culture. And I found that to be very interesting. And I think that in this book, Sophie's mom is the alternative to that. And she's a very smart person who is speaking to young women about the importance of uh, relationships for life satisfaction. So I think it's, it's a refreshing voice. I think it's bold and different, um, but I believe in it personally. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it really came through. And there's a lot of, um, Sophie's mom is one of them, there's a lot of really strong women in the book, Sophie herself certainly, and also Jake's mom, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Professor Malchik's wife as mm -hmm. well is another version of womanhood. There's a lot of really complex portraits of ways to be a woman mm -hmm. um, and what it means with career and family. Um, and I feel like particularly um, with women in the sciences, there's, there's a lot of representation there, which I mean, we don't see a lot of in general, but certainly not in literature. Um, it's, it was really, really neat to see and inspiring, I think probably for young women who would be reading the book. Thank you for saying that. Um, something that I remember is reading an article about Marissa Mayer, the former CEO of Yahoo, who was one of the first, she was the first female engineer at Google. And I remember in an interview, her reflecting on that phase and saying she did not think of herself as the only woman there. She was first an engineer. And so her gender was not top of mind in that situation. And so I do hear um, a lot of gratitude for portraying Sophie as a female in the sciences. Um, but when I was writing it, I didn't think uh, that it was um, unusual. To me, it seemed natural. And she was uh, a physicist first more than she was a woman in the sciences. So I um, was gender agnostic in that way, but everyone um, comes to the page with their own um, beliefs. And so that was the way I was thinking about it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think probably that's why the portrayal comes through authentically, rather than like if someone went at it with an agenda, it might might mm -hmm. seem more heavy handed, but it, it doesn't feel that way at all when you're reading it. It seems perfectly natural that Sophie would be in the field that she's in because that's what she's always gravitated toward. Interesting. And I appreciate the characterization of the women as strong because I do agree. And I do notice, so this is my second book and at the center of both is a woman who chooses to listen to her gut and intuition over the pressures of those around her. So in my first book, Allegra is an investment banker who wants to be a yogi. And if you think about it, what that means is she's rejecting the rewards of the system that she is in for what she believes to have value. So she's saying, oh, you think money is important? I don't, I wanna be a yogi. Oh, you think status matters? I don't, I wanna be a yogi. And then in The Love Proof, Sophie 
She is in the world of academia and what is valued their intellect and IQ. And what does she say? Well, she says, I am actually more moved by the humble heart. And I am more moved by the humble day to day with the man that I love. And I uh, value things that are not found through intellect, but through feeling. And I think that I find that to be a portrait of a strong woman because she is listening to her own gut uh, against the opinions and desires of others. So I think that it's the uh, decision making that is more important than the decision in, in thinking about a woman's strength. Yeah, personally. absolutely. Um, so next question is about Sophie and um, more specifically about the romantic love in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Sophie in particular seems to view her relationship with Jake as almost a kind of perfect love. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's such a thing? And if so, what does it look like? Interesting. So fascinating. I think that this book, it portrays a relationship that uh, takes over each person's life. And it is not a relationship that allows for a balanced existence. It is an all-consuming relationship. It is very intense where this love is the most important thing in each character's life. And I think that it is perfect to these characters because it gives them the feeling of not needing more. And I, more specifically for Sophie, Jake, he takes a while but um, it gives the feeling of not needing more. And that ties into the idea at the heart of the book, which is that connection, deep authentic connection brings peace. And some people turn to work to find that sense of peace, to find that sense of I have enough. But um, in this book, it puts forward the idea that that feeling, that enoughness is found in deep authentic connections. And so, Sophie and Jake, it, this love is perfect because it provides Sophie enough. And I also think that Professor Malchik goes on his own journey throughout the book where he finds deeper connections and that brings him peace, but that is um, a different point. So, but that this is, um, it's fiction and it's a high concept love story. So it is meant to put forward an idea. So I think that your question is actually um, more concerned with reality. And I think that reality, a perfect relationship um, is a springboard for a full life. And I think that it is not an all consuming uh, love that dominates your thoughts and replaces other pursuits. I think that um, a perfect love is one where you're not, um, to quote uh, words that are not mine, but where you're not looking into each other's eyes, but you're both looking out at the world together. That's a great quote. Thanks. I wish I knew who said it, but <laughs> I remember that. yeah, I, I think so. Too. Yeah. And I think maybe it, earlier on, that's where Sophie struggles a bit is she is kind of is consumed by that love. Of yeah. And I think that this is a book which is really about the power of connection to nourish and transform people. And so the both of the main characters are extremely isolated up until that point when they meet. And the purpose of that is to heighten the um, meaning of that connection in both of their lives. And so because Sophie was an only child and because Jake had these demands put on him as a child that forced him to grow up early, uh, because Sophie had gifts that led her to be unable to relate to her peers, they show up at college without peer connections and without a community. And when they connect, it it takes over their lives. And um, so their isolation until that point is meant to uh, heighten the meaning of the connection they ultimately find. Yeah, absolutely. So we heard a little bit of music at the beginning of the session for anyone who was here a couple minutes early, um, just a very little bit. There are two full playlists on Spotify if anyone is interested of music that's associated with the love proof. So obviously music is a very important part of the book. Um, how did you choose the songs for the story and what did they mean to you? Uh, so this, there are two playlists that are associated with this book that I curated. And I know Logic the rapper released a book where he made music that was meant to be listened to while reading Supermarket. I am not a music maker, I am a music chooser. There is no shame in that. Okay. Um, so I made two playlists and one is called the classics and the classics 
is a playlist that occurs in the story itself. And this is something that Jake makes and Sophie and Jake listen to together. And then for the rest of their lives, no spoilers, whenever they hear a song, it emotionally trans transports them back to when they were together in college. And I knew that I wanted to incorporate music into the story because music is emotionally transportive. And that is at the heart of this story, which is that you um, can exist with someone who is not physically present in your life because um, the past and the present are equally real and equally happening now. So I wanted to incorporate music and I wanted this playlist to be called the classics because the classics are things that do not get old. And in a story about permanent connection, I think that that's appropriate. And so the playlist is full of soul music and oldies and music that has stood the test of time, much like the connection that Jake and Sophie have in the story. And it's a similar reason for uh, setting the book at Yale. Yale is also a place that does not age. Um, I'm saying that just as a fact, you know, you go back there and it, or people are living in dorms with the same names. They're taking classes, studying the same periods of history and something about that is preserved. And so I thought in a story about permanent love, set it at a place that is um, almost a geographic time capsule and have this the classics music in there as well, um, which I think together really beautifully evoke permanence. Yeah, that's great. I, I really enjoyed listening to the playlist myself. And I actually, I think I only listened to the classics. So I need to go back and listen to some of the more modern music, which oh, I, I'm yeah, excited well, to do. Yes, well, the, first of all, it's so incredibly thoughtful that the classics was actually playing at the start of the event. That's very neat. And um, the second playlist, The Love Proof, is filled with music that I listen to while writing, which I think communicate the mood of this story. And it's not uh, music you really want to listen to with anyone else. It's filled with ache and um, it's very introverted and you'll go on an internal journey with it. <laughs> um, but that those are the two playlists they are available on my website for people who are interested. Well, that's a great segue. Uh, cause my next question is to, um, have you talk a little bit about your path to becoming a writer? Did you always want to write? Did you come to it later in life? How did you arrive here? Um, so I arrived here through sheer power of will. Um, I've always wanted to be a writer ever since um, I was a child. And I, in college, I wrote two full length novels. And I, so I had, I went, did an internship at Goldman Sachs, got a full-time offer. And then at the end of my junior summer, and so I viewed my senior year as my last chance to get published before I was a banker because bankers don't have free time. No. So <laughs> what I did, <laughs> yeah, fact. So what I did was I, um, I worked in a tutorial class working one-on-one -on -one with a professor uh, and each semester I wrote a book in this class for credit. And so I wrote, there were two science fiction novels and at the end of each semester, I submitted them to agents everywhere. And I never heard back from either one, but the added twist to that is I'd reorganized my schedule. So I only took classes taking place Monday through Wednesday. And then I went home Thursday through Sunday to work on these books that no one was ever going to read because that was, <laughs> that was more important than normal social development. So I went and I, I did that. And then I graduate. Um, the rest of the class went on this trip to Myrtle Beach, which looked amazing. And I was, you know, writing my queries to agents saying, hey, please pay attention to me. Um, but nobody did. So I, long story short, was uh, did not succeed in getting any attention from the publishing world after spending a year uh, trying very earnestly in college, continued to write while I was working full time in finance on breathe in cash out. And so this time after uh, writing on the side for years, I did get agents response. And I think because it's an extremely commercial idea for someone who has worked at an investment bank to write a story taking place in a fictional investment bank that uh, captures uh, some things that were very timely at that moment. Uh, one of them being office angst against the backdrop of lifestyle jobs and uh, Instagram lifestyle jobs. So that's a very funny juxtaposition, which was timely. 
Um, and then there's uh, the banker, she sleeps with her boss, which was tapping into, um, there was a lot of discussion around power dynamics in the workplace at the time. Um, so there were, it tapped into some uh, very timely issues. And so that is just through cold querying and sheer uh, persistence was how I got my foray into publishing. And then I took a leap of faith and have been writing ever since. And I'll do it until people beg me to stop. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't foresee that happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you have any tips for aspiring writers? And what was your proud publishing process like? I guess those are two questions, but they're sort of connected. Um, okay, great question. So I would say a couple of things for aspiring writers. And one is to be prepared for a long game. And I think that um, what I see is I see it is hard to break in. It takes years and years of uh, persistent effort to break into the publishing world. And then what I see is that it is often not a person's debut novel that's a breakout hit not their second novel, but their third, fourth, or fifth, where they really hit it um, and they uh, reach a massive audience. I see, and so that is to say, it's um, it's like becoming a doctor almost in terms of the amount of uh, front-loading investment that I see really successful authors do. Um, so my advice would be to be prepared for that because I know that um, instant success is um, an illusion in, in the business. So be prepared for that and make sure that you really love it because you'll be doing it in the dark for a very long time. Um, so just make sure you, you love it and are prepared for that road. Uh, and then in terms of the craft, I would advise reading widely. I think that, and this is something that V.E. Schwab has said, author of The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue among dozens of others, uh, she has said that reading widely is the best writing education that you can get. And that is something I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, I'm an avid reader. It makes me a better writer. Stephen King is an avid reader. Um, he's, he's doing great. So I think that um, reading widely is um, my piece of advice. And I think that I, when I think back to being a, a young writer, I remember that I had so many uh, I think the the genesis of it for me is that I had so many things that I wanted to express. Um, and I think that over time you learn how to harness that in the craft of storytelling. Um, and I hear this, uh, I don't know if you've seen the Hemingway documentary on PBS, yes. um, but there's a line from there where he was commenting on Hemingway's later work saying, and it didn't have any of that autobiographical first novel stuff. Um, and I think that it is a tendency of um, young writers' first works to be somewhat autobiographical, whether or not it's emotional or not. But then over time, you really harness that desire to express yourself into storytelling. And what helps you do that is reading widely. So I know that's a lot of advice, but um, it's a long road. Make sure you love it. Read widely and um, read widely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that advice elsewhere. One other bit of advice, actually, I heard, heard, I don't know if you've ever listened to the New Yorker fiction podcast. No, I haven't. If you haven't, check it out. I was, <laughs> it was not an author event, but I was watching an interview with uh, Tara Westover, the author of Educated, hmm. um, who, I mean, that was her debut memoir, one of the biggest books of the last few years. <laughs> and they asked her, like, what was your writing process like? And she said, I had no idea how to write. Like, I knew what my story was, but I didn't know how to put it on paper in a way that made sense but she said she listened to the New Yorker fiction podcast which has been out since like 2007 mm. and once a month they choose a writer um a fiction writer usually although they've had like David Sedaris and people like that on too and they choose a story uh the only catch has to be that it has to have been a story published in the New Yorker mm. and the author you know it's a different author's story it can be any author the author who's appearing reads the story and then that author and the um, fiction editor discuss the story and like what makes it work and the elements of it and they kind of break it down. It's like a little mini fit creative writing workshop to listen to. Fascinating. Very cool. Very yeah. Cool. So I started listening to that and that's really fun because you not only hear some great stories, but you hear some really insightful commentary on literature itself. It's kind mm. of like a Way to go back to my days as an English major. I really like it. Oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's fun. 
Um, so you already talked about this a little bit when you talked about breathe in and cash out um, and your journey as an investment banking analyst. Full disclosure, my younger sister was also an investment banking analyst and worked for a hedge fund. So I am somewhat familiar with the path of mm -hmm. how difficult that is. Um, what really led you away from finance and into the world of writing and of yoga, if you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Well, it's a very funny transition because sometimes I have, when I um, meet someone for an event and they read my bio, they don't understand it. They're like, I don't like, how is this all one person? You were in finance, but you do yoga. That doesn't go. And now you're a writer. Like, okay. So I think that they are extremely different and I, and I only appreciate how different they are over time, but I really always wanted to be a writer and my move into finance was um, just to have a job to uh, pay rent and obviously all the things that a job does. So I, but I kept the desire to be a writer and I kept nurturing it and I was persistent over many years. My background in yoga is I started practicing yoga when I was in my mid twenties working in finance. And I loved yoga because it was the opposite of my entire day job. So um, in finance to survive, I had a mentality where I believed more is better, faster is better, don't listen to your body. And it was a world that valued intellect. And in yoga, for the first time, I found messages to slow down and that doing less can be better and that you should listen to your body. And what if you didn't listen to your head? What if you listen to your heart? And I'd never been taught, taught those messages by any authority that I frankly respected before. And I found them to be extremely uh, nourishing and transformational. And, um, you know, before that I'd gone to Yale, I went to Goldman Sachs and I found that um, those are just not messages that were predominant at those institutions. And so finally, um, I found these messages and I loved them. So I worked yoga into my daily routine. Uh, I started an Instagram account called at Madeline Henry yoga. That was uh, where I shared my uh, daily practice with people online and that exists today, but it is now catered more to my author events and uh, news around books. Um, and so that is my background in yoga. And I do find that some of the ideas from yoga work their way into my books now. So the idea of humility is very important in yoga. And I find that that in the love proof, which is actually at its core, pretty anti-intellectual book in how it advocates for feeling over intellect um, and in key moments in life. And so I find that Sophie is a very humble character as well because she could use her intellect to achieve any goal. And the goal that she decides upon is a very humble one. So that is, um, that's how it is seeped into my work. Gotcha. So what is your writing process like? Like when you decide, all right, it's time to write, or I know some writers have like a certain time of day or, you know, have to write a little bit every day or only when inspiration strikes, what's, what's your mode? So I love a daily work count and I, every day I write first thing in the morning as close to waking up as I can. And I try to hit at least, I do hit at least 1000 words a day on whatever story I'm working on. Uh, first drafts are easier. That comes in between three and 5,000 words a day. Uh, the closer it is to being done, the, the harder it is uh, to get to a thousand because I care so much about every individual word, but uh, I'm at a, I'm in a rhythm right now where 2000 words a day is um, what I'm hitting. And I hear 1000 words a day as the uh, very commonly among other professional novelists. Um, if anyone has read Lisa Jewell, the thriller author, I've heard she um, tries to hit a thousand words a day. Um, Stephen King says that he does 2000 words a day. I read an online article that said uh, Michael Crichton did 10,000 words a day. I think it's a lie. I think it's a clickbait. Um, don't trust it. Um, but I, I'm trying to do 2000 words a day because I hear that 1000 is the norm and I'm trying to do double. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you write a novel, do you, or do you, at the outset, do you have an idea of the whole outline of the story or do you kind of just find your way there or is it some combination? 
over time, I find it is much better to find your way there so that you are reading while you are writing. And I think that that is working better, I'm finding, because your capacity to imagine a story in your head is limited and really great stories are really complex. And I think that when you work it out on the page, there are more twists and turns that you can't anticipate. So uh, I've heard that I've heard one mystery author, for instance, say that they don't know who has done the crime when they start the book and they figure it out as they go. And I think that if you are very seriously engaged in your own story in figuring out where it will go, then your reader will be too. Wow, that's, I've heard writing referred to as like trying to drive down a dark road with like one headlight on. So you can <laughs> see a little bit, but everything is dark around you and you're just sort of finding your way through. <laughs> and, and it sounds very daunting, <laughs> but rewarding too. Um, so speaking of writing, uh, do you have another book in the works? It sounds like you do have things that you're working on. And if so, what is that or other projects in the works as well? Thank you for asking. Uh, I am working on a couple of things right now. I'm working on two stories and I will give a teaser of both. So one is um, the one that I'm writing right now is a story about soulmates who reincarnate and find each other in every life across historical eras. So they find each other in ancient Rome. They find each other off the coast of Madagascar as pirates. They find each other in 1793 uh, during the times of yellow fever. And it takes the conceit that the goal of a soul on earth is to mature. And once a soul is mature, they leave into the next realm. So these soulmates are reincarnating and maturing with each other. Um, and I find it to be a very romantic story because it has to do with a love of someone's essence and it's not physical. And uh, I think that that's a really beautiful idea. So that's one, uh, but the one that I think will come out next year, it is called Food Fight. And it is about a family of French chefs. Um, if you're trying to if you're preemptively trying to find a pattern, don't, don't. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Um, so the, the food fight is about a family of French chefs and the, in New York City, and the dad runs a fine dining French restaurant. His daughter has worked diligently by his side for 10 years. Meanwhile, her twin brother went his own way, and he started a restaurant putting burgers between pancakes and waffles and full slices of cake, and he soared to fame as a celebrity chef. And what sounds like it is going to be an amusing story probing family dynamics, dynamics, it actually gets much more into this young woman's head and things are not as they seem. So it's a story rich with sensory detail that plays with your senses. And it's a twisty sensual novel about appetites that ultimately gets into um, the, emotional, um, the emotional ties that people have to food. So those are the things that I am working on. Wow, those sound really exciting. Thanks, that's nice. That is, that is fun. We will look forward to that for sure. Um, so that wraps up our formal conversation for this evening. Does, if anyone has any lingering questions that they would like to ask Madeline, speak now or forever hold your peace um, <laughs> in the chat. And I don't, I think, I think we're all set. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Again, the book is The Love Proof. Get it from Inkwood Books or your local bookseller or the Cherry Hill Public Library or your local library if you're tuning in since we're virtual from anywhere in the world. Um, thank you so much, Madeline, for being here. This was a really great conversation and we appreciate you being here with us for this library event. My pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate your questions. They were extremely interesting and it's been a real pleasure to speak with you. So thank you very much, Tierney. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.